Hi, my name is Raquel, in order to buy or sell, you have to have the money, the beast, on your mind, or in your hand, one of those words they don't translate correctly. Today is October 10th, and I haven't been here for two months, so I'm going to be doing like a two-month show, so I'll cover the Kennedy assassination and a few other things, but there's the apocalypse, it's in the New Testament, and they don't translate this word karagma correctly. And um, you can see the context. No one buys or sells without the money of the beast on their mind or in their hand. And it's, it's not the mark of the beast. It's the money of the beast. And here's the unabridged Greek-English lexicon that shows you the word karagma means the impress on the coin or stamp money coin. So that's what the 666 is money has to do with this show. And I've discovered this thing, I don't remember how long ago, but, you know, I used to have, like, the Strong's Concordance, and then after that, I don't know how I got the idea that this mark wasn't translated correctly, but, um, oh yeah, they had these other encyclopedias at the university, and uh, they were, like, in a blue volume, and they, they went into more depth with a lot of these words, like the word mammon is an Aramaic word for money, and they don't translate that correctly either. It's in the, uh, Jesus Christ said you can't serve God or money. You'll either love the one or hate the other or hold to the one and despise the other. And uh, the word is mammon. And then the Pharisees who loved money uh, heard all this and scoffed. And that's all in Luke 16. And I'm not really a Bible thumper, but, you know, when I first read the New Testament, I um, thought that it was, um, you know, Jesus Christ was revolutionary, and the first thing he did when he entered Jerusalem was to upset the tables of the money changers. And he um, told his disciples to go forth without money in their purses. So, you know, like the whole problem with the church today is this guy, St. Paul, and I don't know why they call him a saint. I, you know, he's the one who has totally usurped the Christian church, and you get these zombies come to your door, or you hear them on the campus telling you that um, you, unless you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, you're not going to be saved. You know, that's just such a ridiculous thing. These guys are like brainwashed zombies. You know, like when I was in high school, one of my high school friends, you know, they were kind of near to well people and they weren't too smart, my high school friends. So one of them ended up joining this Hare Krishna movement and we all kind of like, oh God, you know, we'd go visit him there and get some free food at the Hare Krishna temple in Evanston, Illinois. And um, it, it turned out I went somewhere, where the hell was it? And I ended up running into him again and I said, oh wow, didn't you used to live in Evanston, Illinois? And I says, do you remember me? And whatever. And I, But he was still the same kind of person that was focused on this, you know, or you've got to read this huge book here, you know, or else you're not going to be saved, or, you know, you won't have happiness and peace like I do, of course, you know, they're running around chanting, and whoop-de-doo, you know, it's like, you know, they, they it's like these idiot um, Muslims, too, you know, they all go to Mecca, and they, if you've ever seen, they have, like, millions of people, it's a huge tourist attraction, and I just read an article that said that, you know, when they were designing Mecca, the tourist trap for these Muslims, they have to go on this pilgrimage there, or, you know, it's one of the things they have to do in their life. And then they have to go around this big black rock, this monument. And, of course, the women are separated from the men, and every once in a while they have a stampede, and people get crushed, and they have to throw these rocks at, at the um, devil or something, you know, and... And they had to tear down these architectural buildings from the 14th century and things like that in order to accommodate more of these tourists there. So, you know, these people believe this Islamic religion and they've got like these sects fighting each other. And, you know, the Gospels are very terse and, you know, there's not that much to them. You know, Jesus... Um, summed it up one time in one sentence. Somebody told him, you know, what's the essence of what you're saying? And he says, to love one another or something like that, you know, to love your neighbor as yourself and that kind of a thing. You know, Jesus was a, a communist, and uh, the, the early Christian Aseans, 
they were also communist, and Josephus wrote in the Jewish Wars, he had a thing about, um, oh, the, the Aseans were communists to perfection, and as with brothers, they held all things in common, they carry no baggage, but only weapons, there it is, nothing is bought and sold, everyone gives to um, what he has to anybody in need, and um, they're free to share their possessions. There's a typo there. But uh, they're contemptuous of wealth. So, uh, you know, and they, J- Josephus wrote that in uh, the 90th, um, 90, you know, this whole thing, you know, there's a lot of people that, that don't believe that Jesus even existed. And, uh, you know, like I um, was reading the Caesar and Christ by Will and Ariel Durant. My grandfather really liked that. Um, Mr. Durant, who was kind of a socialist, um, and um, he wrote a good book of philosophy, too, he and his wife, and they were kind of like a history team. And anyway, so like in his Caesar and Christ, he leads off the chapter about um, did, uh, no, did Jesus really exist? Because, uh, like, when Napoleon came into, I forget where, somewhere where he conquered, he asked one of the scholars, the first question he asked him was, did he believe in the historicity of of Christ? And, you know, obviously that this person didn't um, walk on water. You know, that's a metaphor. It's like the Hare Krishna, is ha- the Krishna has a lot of metaphors in there. And, you know, like moving mountains or, or um, things like that, you know, uh, and faith will make you whole. He always said, you know, Jesus didn't heal you. It was your faith that made you whole. It's kind of like the placebo thing. And, you know, you, you've got to kind of have faith. That's kind of what keeps me going, you know, a, a faith in these miracles. You know, I've had these miracles happen to me. These And these people were kind of like angels. I've met these people throughout my life and, you know, a, fallen in love with a few of them, but, you know, I realized that it wouldn't work, it wouldn't last, it, well, I'm not the right person for them, and they're not really the right one for me, and they, actually, one of them even told me that, you know, they, they saw me speaking at the University of Arizona, make, like, in the 80s, and, um, you know, I back then, I found out about this Kennedy assassination, and uh, so I would, har- I would, I, I was about to say, I, was, I harassed these mall preachers. I used to get a kick out of them, and there was this mall preacher named Judd Smock and, um, he, and Sister Cindy, but I knew him before he met Sister Cindy, and he'd come to the University of Arizona, and he, he put on a suit and tie, and he used to be a professor of history in uh, La Crosse, Wisconsin, and um, so coincidentally, I happened to stop off in Urbana, Illinois. I was going back to see my mom and dad. And I, my sister was going there, I think, I think at the time. And I stopped off in Urbana to see her. And I just happened to, Judd Smock was preaching on the mall at the University of Illinois in Urbana. And, he, and the students were harassing him. They were saying, oh, you're, you, you don't believe that six million Jews were killed by the Nazis. And I can't, you know, I just kind of thought, wow, you know, that's weird that these people would say that to him, you know, because I respected Jed Smock, even though, you know, he was one of those people that said you have to confess at the mouth that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, you know, he, he wasn't a stupid person, he just really believed that, you know, and I never really believed that, I, yeah, but I did admire Jesus Christ, and um, so anyway, like, I was doing this research on... Um, people who believed in eliminating money, because I was already interested in, in um, you know, the New, New Testament. And um, so I was doing research on people who believed in eliminating money, because um, it made a lot of sense to me. I asked myself, you know, what would it be like in the kingdom of God? And, um, you know, I, I thought that there wouldn't be any money there, you know, because everybody would love each other and you wouldn't need insurance companies or real estate agents or uh, bankers or cashiers or all these other superfluous jobs that weren't really producing anything. And, and then, you know, we have this huge military budget and we're killing people and destroying homes, you know, and, uh, you know, instead of making the world a better place, we're making it a worse place. And we have these 
cars that are creating all this pollution and um, global warming. And I've got a big confession to make. I've been wrong about this uh, methane extinction thing. And well, I'm, it's not really wrong. It's more of a question of of could it happen and when. And um, yeah, I went to see my sister. I went on vacation <clears throat> and um, saw my sister. And she's like an expert in this peak oil stuff. And uh, she's also very good at this climate stuff. And she's written articles for like Skeptic Magazine. And, and uh, she goes to these conferences and stuff like that. So, you know, I asked her about this methane extinction theory. And she said she studied it. And doesn't believe it, and I never really got into the details of why, but I assume that it's because, and I've heard it, and I've read about it just recently, that you know this methane is really deep under the ground, and it'll take a lot of heat, and it'll, it'll take a while for that to thaw out, and uh, and it, you know, and so the concern was that the, the Arctic Ocean is almost ice-free, and you might have seen that. Like 35,000 walrus ended up beached on up in Alaska there where they plan to do some oil uh, drilling and stuff like that and uh, because the ice is melting up in the Arctic and it you know that, that's a strange thing you know you would think we would know more about whether the Arctic Ocean has melted before in the history of the world and everything you know geologically and all that but they really don't know for sure you know they've found fossils and things like that but um so they i think that you know there's estimates of whether the arctic ocean has melted before and that the critical thing is like i'm saying is these the methane is up in the arctic ocean and um so like if the arctic ocean is ice free and it warms up it'll melt the permafrost and it'll melt the ocean depth and and these methane deposits, I think, you know, they're very deep up there. And and I thought, and I found this out just recently, that uh, that the peat, you know, the peat up in the Arctic, and you know how much carbon is there, and and I thought that, you know, like if the peat was on fire, it would release enough methane or carbon dioxide to create a runaway greenhouse, and everybody would become extinct. But I've read a little bit more about some of these previous extinctions. Like they have this one, it's called, um, well, I know the initials. It's like the P.E., um, I was just about ready to say the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. It's P.E.T.A. or something like that. They had this previous extinction, and um, they still don't really know what caused it. And there's some speculation, but like... Um, in that article, they're saying that if all the peat was burnt up there, there's, that's not enough carbon. So, you know, the problem with this methane extinction theory is, is it's scientific. And, you know, they're, they have these scientific reports on it. And they have all these funny little, like, uh, Greek mathematical numbers and figures and things. And, you know, it's kind of like, a, so I don't, you know, I read these popular articles. And I had that one that was published in the Nation magazine that I kept showing you, this coming instant planetary emergency. And this is what got me started on this whole methane extinction thing. Um, some One of my Facebook friends published a link to this. And, um, and uh, so uh, I read this article. And, you know, I, I mean, this isn't too long ago. And, um, and I didn't read this when it first came out. You know, I've only studied this methane extinction thing for a little while but now I'm not as worried about it you know after talking to my sister and figuring out you know how much real how much of this methane is really there you know it could happen and you know global warming is certainly going to cause the oceans to rise and people are going to have to move Florida the sewer system isn't going to work there and um, if the oceans rise and so that um, we're going to have to move and I was doing this research about this, uh, about eliminating money, and I was do- looking for quotations on it. And I never really believed that, That um, I, you know, I was reading, I don't know how I got started on it, but I was starting to read these Nuremberg um, documents. They had, you know, I studied a lot of this 
Kennedy assassination stuff on the, um, at the University of Arizona here, and they had the complete uh, Warren Report, the 26 volumes, with all the exhibits and everything, and they also had the complete House Select Committee on Assassinations volumes in regards to the assassination of Kennedy and Martin Luther King, and I've studied those very well, including the Martin Luther King thing, and I don't really have a book on the King thing, but I've read a lot about it, and, you know, I used to go to the University of Arizona library and read all this stuff, and I'd hang out there, and, and so I just happened to be walking down the aisle one day, and I came across this book, because I was, you know, Pol Pot believed in eliminating money, and the books on Pol Pot were right next to the ones on the Kennedy assassination. I guess, in the what do they call that, the Library of Congress identification system, um, since it's kind of like modern history, you know, the, the Vietnam War and, and bombing of Cambodia and Pol Pot coming to power and... and uh, and he believed in eliminating money, and so I was researching about him. And Noam Chomsky wrote a book called, um, uh, oh gosh, uh, the After the Cataclysm, and it was about the um, uh, Pol, the Pol Pot coming to power, and you know we've heard about these killing fields, and of course Hollywood made a movie out of it. To, they have to demonize Pol Pot because he believed in eliminating money. It's like the Pharisees demonized Jesus Christ because he believed in eliminating money and, and so did Fidel Castro and um, Plato uh, in his Republic um, the guardians uh, of the Republic didn't touch gold or silver and you know, like I said I was working on this uh, gospel of eliminating money a lot, there's a whole lot of famous people like St. Thomas More's Utopia the Utopians didn't have any money and um, and they so like when I found out about this Kennedy assassination, it really like like you know I lost faith in my government. It it was it was just like somebody punching me in the face or punching me in the stomach, and it was like wow you know our government we had a coup d'état in America, and they killed Kennedy. You know Nixon was in Dallas the day before the assassination happened. In fact, that's one of the Warren Commission exhibits, and um, I have it in, in here. I can tell you what exhibit it is. He was in there for a Pepsi conference. It's exhibit 1975, and uh, he was there just before. Uh, and, and uh, you know, George Bush uh, became the head of the CIA, and uh, there it was in the Dallas Times-Herald, um, the 21st of uh, November. And, of course, Kennedy was, there it is, Nixon today, that was the headline. And then they found these tramps um, behind the grassy knoll, and they uh, happened to look a lot like E. Howard Hunt there. I don't have, I have the one for, there was three tramps, and then the other one looked like Frank Sturgis. And I made this uh, this brochure, like, oh, gosh, in 1985, it's like a collage, and I found all these documents and um, and um, made a reduced them with a Xerox copying machine and uh, made it all fit on this eight and a half by seventeen or eight and a half by fourteen inch page and I had them printed up and and I never really did get to pass these out and I don't you know I used to go to the old student union here. And they used to have these concrete tables there where people would pass out literature or, you know, stuff about their science club or things like that. And and I'd get in a lot of trouble there. You know, the police would always arrest me for um, disorderly conduct or interfering with the peaceful conduct of an educational institution. Uh, then they'd just come up and just grab me and say, hey... Um, they tell me to leave, and I, I'd say, "Look, I've got a right to be here. You know, I'm exercising my First Amendment right." And they'd just grab me and arrest me and throw me in jail. And so, eventually, one of these um, judges down there, his name was Donfeld, and I asked him about this a couple of years later. I said, "Don't you remember? You were you told me that I should um, sue these people or something." And he said, "Oh no, I never told you that." But anyway, I did. 
And so um, we won. I had a lawyer named Jeff Buccella, and I think he's still here in Tucson. And um, he just graduated, and he was doing like pro bono civil liberties work here. And he took my case, and um, we beat him in the federal court and got the university to come up with these free speech rules and everything like that. And um, so he, my lawyer, must have made a lot of money off that, and I got like maybe 5000 out of it. But, you know, this was back in like, oh, 83, 80, 83 or 4. And um, I remember Don Foster, Mr. Foster, was like the dean of students there, and I knew him pretty well. And I, I think Brian Seastone was s still working there. He might have been one of the people who arrested me. And um, this guy, Officer Lovell, was really a lot of trouble but um, and then one of these guys uh, what the heck was his name he was a Jewish guy and he was a cop there and he used to always bust me because he didn't like me talking about this Holocaust stuff at the campus there and so he he ended up becoming um, a county attorney I think and uh, but I haven't run into him lately so after I uh, you know I didn't I saw I was probably walking around the government documents section and, of course, the University of Arizona Library also had all the uh, Nuremberg uh, documents, the, do the blue volumes, and they also had the, um, I don't know what trials they are, but they're the red volumes. And so I don't know why or how or what, but they had somebody in there, I think it was Rudolf Hose or somebody like that, or, and, or it was, I don't know if it was a confession or what, but this guy was talking about cutting people open to get the gold out, you know. And I'm, I think I must have read this maybe, I don't remember, in some book or something. And they referenced these um, volumes of these Nuremberg things. And so I never really believed that these civilized Germans <clears throat> would cut people open to get the gold out of them. I mean, you know, these Jews... When they put them in the concentration camps, they allegedly swallowed all their gold and their diamonds and, you know, so that the Nazis couldn't take it away from them. But, I mean, if they had gold and diamonds, they would have gotten a, a boat ticket out of there a long time ago if they had enough. Or, and so a lot of these poor people ended up in these concentration camps. And then the, they had these epidemics of uh, typhus, which is caused by lice. And, like, during World War I, they had like two million or three million people alone die of typhus in Russia. And so they had all these delousing facilities. And um, so when you go in there, you have to, they shave the women's hair and they'd take all your clothes away and they'd make you take a shower and they'd have a doctor on the platform of the railroad station. And that's what Dr. Mengele did. He was trying to make sure that you know, you don't bring an epidemic into the concentration camp. Just like today, you know, we're concerned about this Ebola, you know, and so, you know, you have to have a, a doctor there to look into your eyes and just see the way you look, you know, and ask you if you're okay. And, um, and if you weren't okay, then they didn't take you to the gas chamber right away. They'd take you to the hospital. Auschwitz had a hospital there. But like first, and then they, but like I was saying, they'd they have to, they, every once in a while, they'd have an epidemic at Auschwitz, you know, and um, up, to, up to 300 people a day would die. And Auschwitz had like, uh, I think they were going to eventually make like 60,000 people there. I don't remember how many, but there were a lot of people there. And, you know, 350 people dying a day of typhus during an epidemic isn't really, you know, that much. I mean, there's been a lot of people in Africa die of this Ebola already, I think maybe 4,000, and they're expecting like a million people to, to by January that are going to come down with this in Africa. And they're even saying on TV that they could bring it over here. But so these um, the typhus epidemics, <clears throat> and they had this um, Zyklon B, which is a hydrogen cyanide, and they'd pack it in these cans, and they'd use that to um, fumigate the clothes to kill the lice. And they would also use it like if the um, barracks got full of lice, just like bed bugs or something. You know, a lot of these hotels now, I've been reading reports. I'm thinking of going to Los Angeles 
because my favorite singer is going to be there in December, the middle of September, December. So I'm looking for a hotel, and I'm reading all these reports around Koreatown that they have like bed bugs in some of these motels, and they're, you know, don't try to save money there, go to a better one. And this, these are recent reports. So anyway, like. Um, I'm pretty relieved to not have to worry about this methane stuff, and my lawyer uh, finally prevailed over this guy who's been suing me, and so that's a big heavy relief and a lot less panic and um, tranquilizers I have to take. I haven't had to take one for quite a while. But uh, so, like, um, you know, they had um, Zyklon B to kill the lice, and then they had these uh, fumigation chambers where they'd put the clothes. And the, like I was saying, it comes in these cans. So, like, if you're going to fumigate the barracks, I think you end up you end up dumping it out or something like that, and and the, it'll dissipate out of there. And it takes a while for it to all dissipate. And and like a lot of these people say that the Nazis just dumped this stuff through a hole in the ceiling and then swept it out the doors, but you just don't do that with hydrogen cyanide. You know, it's a very toxic, poisonous gas. You're not going to exterminate thousands of people at a time with with this hydrogen cyanide because it's dangerous and it's explosive and you have to wear gas masks and you have to neutralize it. Like when they have these um, hydrogens, these gas chambers here in Florence, Arizona, where they used to kill people, they have a airtight chamber with, with um, a, a chimney that goes up and then they have to, after they put the sodium cyanide in a, in a bucket and um, add, I think they have to add sulfuric acid to it, and then the gas comes up and um, and then it, it asphyxiates you. But then they have to neutralize the gas with water or something, and then they have to ventilate it, and and then you have to go in with gas masks and water and everything. I don't remember. And so, like, if the Nazis are going to exterminate thousands of people. I once had a contest, you know, I asked people, you know, what is the best way to exterminate six million people? And I had one person say, you know, a good way to do it would be to, you know, they had all these people on these railroad cars, so why wouldn't you just um, back the train into a, a, a canal full of water and they could all drown, you know, and that would be, you wouldn't have to worry about the cyanide and neutralizing it and going in with gas masks and everything else. And you can, it, it penetrates through your skin, too, so you have to wear rubber gloves. And, and um, you know, it's a big mess. And, it, and, you know, you read some of these so-called eyewitness reports, like I'm dumping it through the hole in the chimney is ridiculous. And um, what they did in these fumigation chambers was they had a little door, and you open it up, and you put the can in there, and you shut the door, and then you have a crank, and it opens up the can, and um, and then there's a heater in there too, because the air temperature has the hotter it is, the faster this stuff dissipates. And there's also a fan and a blower, so you get the gas through all these clothes in these fumigation chambers. And I, I don't have a picture of it, but they had some of these chambers at Dachau, and the United States Army went in there and uh, took pictures of it, and they claimed that it was a, a, an extermination chamber, but later th that allegation was denied, and all the so-called death camps were in behind the Iron Curtain, and uh, the communist propaganda you know, against the evil Nazis was to... Um, to um, come up with these stories, and you know, if you read like the whole history of this, like uh, there's a lot of good books about it. And the first one I read was this one called "The Hoax of the 20th Century" by Arthur Butts, and um, Mr. Butts is a professor of electrical engineering and computer science at Northwestern University, and he wrote this book. I think the first edition was 77, 1977, and um, so how did I come across that book? I don't remember, but like I said, Judd Smock was talking about it at the University of Illinois, and I was skeptical about the Nazis cutting people's stomachs open. I mean, these these are looking for gold. You know, first it seems kind of absurd that these people would have any money, uh, and um, and then you know, they were otherwise they would have bought their way out or gotten something. You know, it's like 
it, and what happened to the, the, these people was <clears throat> first Hitler wanted to get them out of the German territory, and so um, they pushed them across um, Poland into the Soviet Union, and then the Soviet Union took them and put them f further away in, in Siberia and stuff like that. And then once the Iron Curtain came down, a lot of them lost contact with their relatives, and then a lot of them um, ended up um, changing their names and and you know yet then a lot of people even tell me you know well what happened to the six million well that's a vast exaggeration and there's been some books about the demog demography of um, you know the Jews of Eastern Europe there and everything and they've kind of come to the conclusion that that there couldn't have been that many dead there's maybe like 300,000 or or I can't remember the exact numbers, but 600,000 is a, a vast exaggeration. So they um, they had to demonize Hitler. And the reason I think they demonized Hitler was because he was against this, what he called the Jewish banking system, where they charge interest on, on loans and things. And it was one of the National Socialist Party program planks to abolish interest on loans, it's the 25-point program of the Nazi Party, and one of, like I said, it's in big capital letters. It's kind of a hard document to find, and a lot of the documents don't actually put it in capital letters. But I've seen it this way, and it's a huge emphasis, you know, this interest on loans. And you know, Germany after World War One, they didn't have any gold, and they didn't have the gold standard, and uh, and so. Um, they had to barter with um, other countries to get the raw materials. And so um, they were beating this Jewish system. And not only that, but the German workers had really good benefits. And Hitler was building this like huge resort for the workers along the, uh, what is that, the Black Sea, and, uh, or whatever that is there. Here's the map of Germany. And you can see what happened during the war and everything. That um, really uh, changed <clears throat> this Hitler. You know, the, they had a vote uh, to reunite Austria. You know, like the German kingdom before World War One. That's territory lost uh, in 1919. They, Germany lost this area to Poland, and they needed a corridor to get to East Prussia. This was part of Germany, and so. This was the whole reason why they had this uh, this war, is because um, and there's some kind of resources down here, you know, like coal or something. And of course, Poland had a lot of coal, but um, you know, Hitler made no secret about wanting to have living space <clears throat> in Poland. He wanted to have Liebenstrom, but <clears throat> there's this this Danzig. This whole area used to be Germany, and they but. After World War One, they lost this territory, and there was no way to get from here to there without going by sea. And then they lost this city of Danzig, this port here. So Hitler wanted to have a, a, a corridor from one place to another, you know, like a four-lane freeway with a railroad, you know, to get from one place to another. And um, Poland didn't let him do that. And... Um, so, you know, that was the the whole, um, it finally gave him a reason. And, and the only way that the United States got involved was this Pearl Harbor thing. And this guy named uh, Henry Stimson, who was Secretary of War, wrote in his diary that we have to maneuver Japan into firing the first shot. And so a lot of these 9-11 people that believe that, that there was a, controlled demolition to bring these buildings down, uh, say that um, this 9-11 was a new Pearl Harbor. In fact, the, these neocons had this book. It was called the something about the American Century or something, uh, the New American Century. But they talk about um, a, we need a new Pearl Harbor in order to get these Middle Eastern wars. You know, we had to demonize Saddam Hussein in, in order to... Um, you know, go in there and take the oil, and you know, he the, they had the bath party there. If you want to understand this ISIS, and I just heard this the other day, but the um, bath party 
is is uniting with ISIS, and uh, the, they were socialists. You know, Saddam Hussein was a socialist, and there's rumors, or I, you know, I haven't really confirmed this, that like he was planning to sell his oil in euros instead of the American dollar, and then also he had a huge army that was dedicated to overthrowing Israel, and he was also funding a lot of these. Um, bombers in, in the Gaza concentration camps. So, you know, he was enemy number one of these neocons, and so they had to get a war against him, and then they they started this 9-11 thing. They, they blew up these World Trade Center in order to start all these wars, and you can see there's, like, pieces of steel that are just, like, ejecting out of here, and this is an explosion, you know, and they brought it down, you know, I've there's, I think I've got a few of this up on my Facebook page. But that, not only that, but like later that day at like 5.30 in the afternoon, uh, World Trade Center building number seven came straight down, just like, you know, a classic controlled demolition. You know, this, this one here was from the top down because it was, you know, such a big building. You know, you had, in order with, you know, to bring down these buildings in, you know, without, and they had, some destruction of the buildings next door. You know, these steel beams came shooting out of there. And um, so they have to um, uh, get a, it's called a, like a false flag operation <clears throat> to uh, blame it on somebody else. Well, Pearl Harbor was a setup. And um, this 9-11 was a false flag. You know, they blamed it on these, um, these Saudi Arabian uh, Taliban or whatever they are, and went after bin Laden in uh, Afghanistan. And of course, after that, um, all the heroin production, like the Taliban got rid of the heroin production in Afghanistan. And then it was, you know, right after that, the American troops go in. And basically what what's going on there now is it's a narco, a narco state. And, um, and it's like Karl Marx said that Religion is the opiate of the masses, and of course, heroin is an opiate, and opiates stupefy people. And and like they have a new movie coming out. I want to see it with Gary Webb, who um, was a news reporter for the San Jose Mercury, and he came out with this story about the Nicaraguan uh, Contras were running cocaine, and apparently they were running it right into Mena, Arkansas. You know, Bill Clinton was involved in this. And, of course, Co Clinton looks like he was a big cocaine uh, head, and uh, Hillary is just ridiculous and absurd. You know, this, the, she um, was Secretary of State when they started bombing uh, Muammar Gaddafi. And I've got a news article here. I haven't been through any of these, but there's a news article here where Obama says that, that he kind of didn't expect the problems we're having in Libya. And Gaddafi was another one of these guys who believed in eliminating money. He, had, he was a socialist, a communist, really. And, uh, and, and um, Ronald Reagan ended up bombing Gaddafi. In, uh, in, what the heck was it? I don't, I don't remember. But I wrote this brochure quite a while ago. And you can compare the difference between what Muammar Gaddafi wrote in his Green Book to what I wrote there. So... You know, the people we have ruling us today are just like psychos and psychotic. You know, they're, like I was saying, there was a coup d'etat in Dallas on November 22nd, 1963. And, and um, George Bush was the head of the CIA. And, um, and, and like Gerald Ford, President Gerald Ford was on the Warren Commission. And then Ronald Reagan was on this, uh, it was the 1975... Uh, uh, Rockefeller Commission on CIA, CIA activities within the United States. And there was, uh, like right after the Watergate in 72 uh, or 3, they had these pictures of, you know, E. Howard Hunt and Frank Sturgis. They were both involved in the Watergate burglary. And um, so one of these Kennedy assassination buffs happened to see a picture of Howard Hunt and one uh, and the, they had three tramps who were arrested 
behind the grassy knoll getting into a railroad car. And um, there's a, a lot of people are saying that, you know, they, they heard shots from the grassy knoll and you can see Kennedy's head being blown backwards and the, the blood came out the back of his head and blew his brains out and that's why Jackie Kennedy is getting out of her seat and going back onto the hood of the car to, to grab his skull and brains and stuff and she was holding on to it even when she got to the hospital. So after, there must have been one of these three tramps and I don't have a picture of a third one, but one of them, Hunt was like, you know, a CAA agent and he was involved with uh, anti-Castro Cubans and they were setting up um, um, Oswald to appear to be a pro-Castro um, you know, um, they were trying to make him look like, um, well, they set him up. He was a patsy, and he, Lee Harvey Oswald even said he was a patsy. But, and Frank Sturgis actually worked in a casino down in Cuba. So they were like anti, they were, they were, they hated Kennedy because of this failed Bay of Pigs thing. And Nixon, in some of his, uh, in some of those White House tapes, is talking about this Bay of Pigs things, and it's a code word for the Kennedy assassination. And and H. L. Haldeman, in in his diary, uh, admitted that. And it's a very curious, strange thing. And I've got it up on my website. You know this this dialogue between Haldeman and Nixon about this Bay of Pigs thing. And Haldeman even writes this, and is that he even figures it out that this must have been a code word for the Kennedy assassination. And like I was saying. Uh, Ronald Reagan was on this uh, House, you know, the, the um, R Rockefeller Commission on CIA activities. So all these past presidents have been involved in some way to cover up this conspiracy, or you know, eventually, I guess they probably figure. And this is kind of the same thing that I think Earl Warren and Lyndon Johnson. You know, a lot of there's a few books out now that say Lyndon Johnson had a lot to do with this, and. Um, I don't know if he was. I don't think he was. I think he just came to realize, and this is what he told Earl Warren, is that, you know, unless we can tell the public that, you know, uh, we've got to quash all these conspiracies or we could start World War II. You know, we can't blame uh, Castro for doing it, and um, we can't um, um, blame the Soviet Union. You know, we had that Cold War. And I, I want to talk about this. I've been talking, talking, talking. But they've had this graph in the New York Times showing this higher education gap. And um, they, this um, shows you who is better off now than before. And uh, the, the children in Russia have a better education than their parents do. And... Uh, they're way ahead of everybody, you know. Uh, Korea, well, they're pretty close. Finland, Belgium, France. And then you get way down here. Uh, where is America? Way down here. Yeah, look, we're, we're doing worse than average. So fewer, you know, the parents are smarter than the kids these days. And it's getting bigger over here, too. And a lot of that has to do, whoops, you can't see it. A lot of that has to do with the... Um, uh, you know, the immigration problem we have here, you know, and uh, so anyway, this was in today's paper, and the, the Russians are smarter, like I'm saying, and they're not taking all this Obama stuff for, um, you know, uh, sanctions against them, and they're going to start um, confiscating property, and here's here's like a McDonald's that's closed, and and they're con the if we're going to put these sanctions on, then, then Russia is going to seize American corporation property there and compensate any Russian that loses money because of these sanctions. So I just kind of thought that ties in with Allen Ginsberg's Howell and, uh, and his poem called America. And it's just kind of ironic that, um, well, just, you know, I... This is really a communist thing, and I really like it because uh, he says, when can, where is it here? Uh, oh, gosh. Um, when can I go into the supermarket and buy what I need with my good looks? In other words, 
you know, without money. And so then he says, America, I used to be a communist when I was a kid. I'm not sorry. And then it goes on over here uh, about Russia. Oh, yeah, here it is. America, it's them bad Russians. And um, them Russians, them Russians, and them Chinamen, and them Russians. The Russia wants to eat us alive. The Russia is power mad. She wants to take our cars from out of our garages. Her wants to grab Chicago. Her needs a Red Reader's Digest. Her wants our auto plants in Siberia. Him big bureaucracy running our filling stations. And he goes on and on. But he wrote this like in like, like 1956. And, um, you know, we used to have the, the communist boogeyman. And, and of course... Um, uh, Dick Cheney is head of Halliburton and Eisenhower warned us about the military industrial complex and Kennedy was trying to get us out of the Vietnam War and um, Johnson escalated it to, and Eisenhower warned us about you know this military industrial thing it's and it's a huge part of our budget and it destroys buildings and people and depleted uranium and uh you know, it just creates refugees, and I've, you know, I'm just really so sympathetic with these refugees. And here's a map showing all of the. There's three million refugees, more than three million refugees from Syria, and it shows where they're all going. I think this Assad guy is a good guy too, but he is an enemy of Israel, and so they want to get rid of him, and they probably want to put pipelines through here or something, you know, and. They just want to get rid of Assad. So, um, you know, this, you know, we were funding uh, Osama bin Laden. You know, he was like a CIA asset. And um, so they had to set this 9-11 um, thing up and, in order to get us involved. But, uh, you know, I've studied this 9-11 thing. I've read a lot of books on it. And I just found out about this methane thing a few months ago. And so I haven't really... The only thing I've read are these popular articles, and there's not that much about it, you know. The, uh, but there are some critics, like this guy um, uh, McPherson, uh, Guy McPherson, and uh, you know I heard him speak. Of, it was co so coincidental because I just found out about this methane stuff, and then coincidentally, this Guy McPherson was speaking at the Antigone Bookstore, and. Um, you know, I asked him a question, you know, are, is it really going to cause extermination all over the earth, you know? And he said, yes, because if um, if it's 90 degrees with, with like 100% humidity for a long time, no human can survive that. It's just, you know, it'll, it's, I don't, you know, I forget what they call it, but so he thinks that that could happen with this methane release, but... Um, like I was saying, I think this methane is too far down, and um, you know they they don't have enough of a history record of of this methane. They they're going to get some satellites up there to measure it better, but we don't know. I mean, we do have records of how much was there back in uh, you know just like you know how much CO two was around. So, but there hasn't. Um, there hasn't been any indication that it's coming out any faster now than it ever has been, and the majority of this methane comes from from cows and uh, all the cows we have and sheep and pigs create like twenty percent of this methane and methane is a uh, much worse greenhouse gas than uh, than c o two so anyway, you know we're living unsustainably. And, uh, you know, once the oceans start rising, and it's already inevitable that they are, then we're, it's going to cause mass migrations. And, um, you know, things just can't go on like this. But anyway, miracles could happen. The only way to really have a sustainable society is to, to get rid of money and to get rid of these international boundary lines and um, start to have world peace. And I wanted to show this. John Lennon, this was in the paper the 9th, which was John Lennon's birthday. And it's a whole full page ad. And it says, imagine all the people living life in peace by John Lennon and uh, uh, by Yoko Ono, imaginepeace.com. 
And Lenin, you know, he was killed, uh, I believe, through a, a hypno-programmed young delusional man. Anyway, God bless, peace and love. Bye. <laughs>